So this is Mac Labs 101, <laughs> for lack of a better term. We're just going to go over some stuff that is very basic that you can do, whether it be automated, through terminal, anything that you can do to improve your lab experience for your users, whether it be something that you're providing to them or information you're providing to them so that maybe they don't come to you with a question that you could provide that answer before they even think of needing the answer to that question. So I'm Bryce Carlson. I'm a senior support engineer at Jamf Software, so I'm in the support department. I was previously at UW-Green Bay and before that at the Appleton Area School District, uh, both in Wisconsin, of course, with Green Bay. Uh, did Mac OS and iOS at both. We started with ARD and Deploy Studio way back, and then we moved to the JSS, and that's kind of how I got involved with Jamf then. My hobbies are basically anything that's not this. Uh, if you guys went to Pam's workshop yesterday, which I'm calling Don't Kill Yourself Early, she recommends that. Get as far away from technology as you can when you're not doing it. Um, that's that's kind of what I do. So your lab might be eight iMacs, which, by the way, the G4 iMac is the best iMac. It's the coolest. On the mic. You guys got that? There you go. OK. Is that better? OK. G4 iMac is the best iMac, because it's the coolest. That's what I started with when I was a kid. So let's say you got eight of them. Maybe you got more, or more, or more. You might not have any way that you're managing them right now. They might just be ones you ripped out of the box. You got it set up with some accounts. People are using them, and they're happy, because it's a Mac. But they're going to have some problem areas. People are going to come to your help desk, and they're going to say, how do I log in? What's my password? We can't really help you with that one, but we'll get into some stuff about that. What why does it say my password is wrong? You know, where's that lessons folder that you guys were talking about for class? How do I print? How do I print duplex? How do I print with color or not? Uh, why won't this app launch? Why is it talking to me about updates? Do I do them? Do you do them? So we kind of go into the whole belief set of should you control that or should you manage and guide them? So just a quick show of hands. I just want to kind of gauge everybody's technical here. Uh, how many people use terminal on a daily basis? Okay. How many people think that the end user knows what you do on the other end of it? Okay. All right. So what we're here to do is we're here to guide them and get them the right info. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I actually, I use a quote from my eighth grade math teacher, Miss Cook. There's many roads to grandma's house. So as far as technically what we're going to be looking at, this is kind of going to be our technical agenda. We're going to look at the login window, how to configure it, but also what information can you put in there that might ease some questions. How to SSH to Mac. How many people show a hands SSH to Macs on a daily basis? OK. Might be more after this. How many people use ARD? All right, that's good. That slide about what is ARD will be interesting then. We're also going to talk about the policy banner. How many people here use the policy banner? Who knows what the policy banner is? Nice. OK, you guys might like that. We're going to talk about keychain. Who here loves keychain? <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's what I thought. How many people here use launch agents or daemons? How many people here know what they are? OK, good. Uh, adding printers with special options and the like, because we all love printers just as much as we love keychain. It's, yeah. And then some commands to control and do updates. Some power management stuff. Who here manages when their Macs power on and off? OK. It's a nice little touch. And then if we have time at the end and there's no other questions, I would like to move on to a discussion of what do you guys do for refreshing your labs? When do you do it? Or do you never do it until you get new hardware? So hopefully you take away a morsel. Like I said, this is, some of this is going to be reviewed for some people. But as long as you get one thing, hopefully that's good. Like when I took the CCT, I didn't know you could customize the toolbar. And I'd been using uh, Composer for a very long time. So that's one more so I took out of that. So we'll start with problem one. How do I log in? So we'll use the login window and policy banner. So everybody knows here what the login window looks like. When you get a Mac out of the box, it's going to have your icons. You'll, you know, you'll have your doc brown and your test account. You know. In a lab, you want it to have something like the username and password. 
a little bit more professional, a little bit cleaner. But there's nothing on the bottom there, really, and we'll get into that. We know we can change this in system preferences, but there's also a command we can run. So in terminal, if you go and run sudo defaults right, and we change the property list for the login window, all of these uh, commands, by the way, will be available in the slide deck. I submitted them. I'm going to submit them again because I made a few changes, so they'll be available, I think Gretchen said, after Friday. So this is all in there in the PDF. So no need to scribble any of them down furiously. So if we run this, we'll show that full name section. OK, that's great. But what about our information at the bottom? We want something there that tells them what to do. So when I was at UW-Green Bay, we had Active Directory accounts for every student. Show of hands, who here uses Active Directory for student accounts? OK, yeah, that's Education 101 pretty much uses that. And we had it kind of branded. We called it your campus account. They didn't know what Active Directory was. So if they'd come to the help desk, you know, what, what does that mean? What is Active Directory? So we would always throw at the bottom, you know, welcome to the lab. Please log in with your network account. Or if you're at UW Madison, they call it their net ID. So they put that there. Double-edged sword, because then you're training users to not know what they're actually using. But as long as you can keep the terminology straight, good to go. You can also run a defaults right command to add this in there. And then in the quotations here, when you edit that property list, you're throwing a message in there. One side note, you can't use the exclamation mark in there. So if you want to yell at the users, you can't. Um, it just it takes it as an argument, kills the command. OK, great. So we got these commands, and we can run them. But we don't want to run that on every single Mac. That's no better than going and clicking in system preferences. So we want to work smarter, not harder. That was told to me by the Mac ad admin former to me uh, when I was at UW-Green Bay as a student. So we could SSH to the Mac, or we could use ARD to send that command. Who here uses ARD to send commands? OK. OK, let's say we want to SSH. Well, first you've got to hop into system preferences, turn on remote login so that people can get to it. OK, great. And that's kind of a prerequisite to some other stuff we're going to talk about. You could configure this in your image, maybe. Or if you're just ripping them out of the box, this is the one thing you do. And then after that, hands off. So if we wanted to SSH in, for those of you who haven't done it, you'd SSH, you put your username at, and then the IP address of what you're going to. Or if you've got DNS, what the fully qualified of that computer is, RSA is going to bark at you about what your key is. You say yes. You put in the password for that account on that computer. And then you're off to the races. You can run whatever you want on that computer. To leave it, just type exit at any time. OK, great. But that still means you would need to run any of those commands we just talked about every single time on every single computer. So if you went out and got ARD for the low, low price of $79.99, which is available there on the iTunes link, you could take a collection of computers that are enrolled in ARD and run that command, run it as root, run it as the current user. I usually run it as root just so that it will go through with some of the stuff for permissions no matter who's logged in and you're doing it silently in the background, there might not be somebody there. So you go ahead, you run those commands. But before you do that, again, just like SSH, you got to go through and turn on remote management. Now, maybe you could build a script into your imaging process, however you do it, or you could turn SSH on and there's one other thing you do then. Who here uses the kickstart command? All right. So ARD kickstart which is available at this link, more about it, you can run a command that will enable anything that's in this window. And you can, there's flags on that KB doc um, where you can figure out which ones you want, what privileges you want, what settings you want. And if you run that kickstart command, that's going to go turn that on for you. And then you can enroll those computers in ARD. So if all you did when you ripped that Mac out of the box, if you're not doing anything else, you go run that SSH setup in system preferences, let's say you got 20 max. You do that, you walk away, OK, you SSH to each one, or you, SSH, or, or you, you, or you run this command from maybe a flash drive. You got it in a text file, you plug it in. OK, great, copy, paste, run it, I'm out. Then you can go and run everything from ARD from that point on. Just a couple differentiations. I have the top command is just going to two users that were on the computer. 
bottom one is just all, because you can kind of get a little bit granular about who does that with that command. So that's great. We know what we can do with the login window. We know how we can do that through SSH. We know we can do that through ARD. But there's another way to do that, because again, there's many roads to grandma's house. So we could use a profile. Who here uses profiles regardless of where they come from? OK. So profiles you could get from the Apple server app and profile manager. You could get it from open source tools like Profile Creator, where you'd actually build it. You could do it from MCX to profile if you've got old MCX settings lying around. You could use any other MDM that generates that. But if you want to learn more, I mean, we could have a day-long session on all about profiles. But thank, uh, thank, uh, thankfully, Richard at University of Utah put out a blog post. I think he actually probably spent the 4th of July weekend, it looked like, writing this. Because it was about like nine pages long, and it came out just last week. It's a fantastic write-up about all the ins and outs, how you could write it by hand, how you could uh, you know, source it from any other tool or piece. It's a great read. Highly recommend it. But for the purpose of what we're talking about today, we'll just assume you've got the server app. Maybe you don't have an Apple server. Let's say you just go out, you buy ARD, and you buy the server app. You don't have an actual Apple server. You don't have clients enrolled. But we're just going to generate that profile. So maybe on your Mac, you install the server app just so you can maybe make a cool caching server at home, because everybody wants a caching server at home. And you can go and generate that profile and download it. So we'd go hop into Profile Manager. We'd make a, a new group or a new setting, or have a device that we can make as a, as a blank record, basically, to get that profile generated. We'll go in, we'll throw our information in, we'll say, yeah, we want to uh, go ahead and show the additional information for the time settings, different like that. Um, we put our message in there of, you know, this is a test message, please log in with your network account, whatever you want. You can pick if you want it to be username or password uh, or icon or not. And then, of course, we've got a couple of other nice options we can do. Disable automatic login, turn off. Apple ID at setup that, uh, I won't call it annoying, but that nice pop-up that comes up to all your users saying, please log in with iCloud if they log in with an account that's never been on that Mac before and it generates a new home folder. So we can set all that, generate that profile, hit save for our changes. We can go hit download and we've just got that one payload in there then. When we hit the download button, it's going to pop up in system preferences and say, hey, do you want to install this? If it's your machine and you're making restrictions or something, probably not. But you can just hit cancel. And then you can put it on a flash drive. And if you've got you know, maybe a dozen Macs, sure. You could go walk around, plug that flash drive in, double click it, you're out. Or you could use the profiles binary. Who here has used the profiles binary? OK. So nice thing about profiles binary, we could, if we know where this file is, we could say profiles hyphen I for install, hyphen F for file path, where's our file? And it would install it then as long as we have the rights to do so. But how do we make this automated with ARD? Because you know, we've gone through the trouble of getting those enrolled, or maybe we've done it and it's packaged out and it was in your image in just a folder somewhere, and we want to deploy that. So let's say we pull up ARD, we pull up copy, we take our file, and we'll specify where we want it to go. We'll just put it in temp for now. So we drag that file in, say to go to temp, and we'll copy it to the computer. Great. Our mobile config is now on the computer. Now we can take that command, and since we know it's in temp, put the path in there, run that as root. We'll bring up our computer here. Right now, no profiles. OK, great. Go ahead, send that command. Command's been sent. We'll close and relaunch system preferences on the client computer. Boom, our profile's installed. That way, you can kind of semi-do it silently. I mean, we just had it logged in so we could see the results, but that could have happened in the background. So we can go ahead, log out. It's kind of slow. It's traditional flatter drive. And there you go. We got our login window set now. So that's just one quick and easy way you can do that somewhat silently in the background without having it enrolled. It's going to loop. Without having it enrolled and just copying the file there. Now, if we want to get a little bit fancier, and we'll talk a little bit about removing files kind of through this method. We could have put after that command there, when we paste it in, we could have put a remove command to get rid of that file from our staging area. That way it's not lingering around after. So that's all fine and well. That's good. And we'll move on to our next problem. It's kind of on top of it. 
how do I log in, how do I print? So I talked about the policy banner. And what the policy banner is, is basically if you go ahead and make one and throw it in the file location we're going to talk about shortly, and again, there's a KB link to learn more about it, this will come up before someone logs in. When you boot the computer, it's going to be that black background and then the image with your banner. If the computer's already been booted and Susie or Timmy student have used the computer and logged out and they're just sitting there, policy banner will splash back up after a, I think it's about a 10 or 15 second timeout of no one using anything on the screen on the login window. So that information will always be there. And you could put kind of like on Windows, like I grew up with in my various school districts, terms and conditions that may apply and various fine print about how to use the computer. But you could also put something that's a little bit more useful. Maybe you go to facilities and you get a layout of the lab that you're in. And you say, OK, for the computers that are in this room here, let's get a JPEG or a PNG. And we'll say, you are here. And we'll put that in line with this in our policy banner. And you'll say, welcome to classroom 101. You are here. The printers are over here. Because no one ever reads a poster. You can just go and put this information so that it comes up before they log in, and they know physically where the printers are now. You could give them some direction on how to log in, maybe more detailed than just your line of text at the bottom. You could provide them more information, but obviously be careful about overusing that, because you overuse that just like posters. People quit reading it. So that location, if you're doing a text only, just a .txt file. If you're doing an inline image, rich text file. All you got to do is drop it in library security, and then the next time the Mac boots, that'll pull up as long as permissions are you know, OK with it, meaning if you restrict access to everybody but yourself and remove root and wheel, and no one has access to the file, it's not going to go. But as long as you have it fully accessible, you're good to go. So I'll use my alma mater. We'll say, OK, welcome to Instructional Services 1129J. Lab is like a beehive. There's a lot of different rooms off of it. You could say, you know, enjoy the lab if you have any questions. Front desk is around the corner. And if no one's there, call a phone number, because that'll get you to the help desk. That way you get some information to them. We save it. We copy it in. If you do it manually, just through Finder, it's going to ask you to authenticate. So it gets the right permissions there. And library security. Then when someone logs in, you're going to get this when the Mac boots up. They get the message. If they say accept. It just kind of does a nice fade, and they're at the login window. You let it sit, it'll come back without the black background, of course, if, if it's just been sitting there. So I'm going to take a pause here quick. Does anybody have any questions on anything we've talked about thus far? There you go. When you're deploying with the uh, Apple remote desktop. Mm -hmm. Can you multiple select machines or you just Yep, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. In and my example there, because I don't have a fun lab to play with anymore at Jam. So so the follow-up question to that is if obviously if they're not online you can't do anything. Correct. Is there a way to make it retry or you just have to come back later and look and you can schedule. Um, so there is stuff in the documentation right for ARD where you can say, I want to schedule this task to run X times a day or at this point, the catch being ARD needs to be on, on that Mac. So let's say you have a dedicated help desk Mac. That's what Green Bay had. It was just one that we took for Mac calls. That one always had ARD on, running various different stuff that maybe we didn't put in the JSS, was just a little quick fix for different things. And because the student workers didn't have access, but they had access to that and could make a change request there, they'd go in, put that command in there, whatever they need to run, and they could schedule it if that Mac wasn't on. Now, there's no reporting outside of your history in there, so it's not really full featured, but for quick and easy, it's definitely there. Gotcha. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I'll just leave the catch box there and we'll pass it as we need then. Anybody else? Any questions on that? Okay. What's my password? If we knew that answer. Uh, we'd all have a million dollars if we had a dollar for every time someone came to the help desk asking about their password or asking for a password reset. Or maybe they'll come and say, why does it say my password's wrong? And that's a cryptic kind of thing. It could be just literally that they're typing it wrong or 
something's wrong with their account. But more often than not, I found it's keychain, and people misinterpret what that means. So show of hands, who here has seen this message? Yeah, who here loves this message? You love it? <laughs> so we'll use my Timmy student who was trying to log in before. So Timmy student goes and logs in on the first day of class. He's all excited. He gets to use a Mac for his Design 101 class. Great. He gets logged in with his ID account. But the university has a three-month password reset policy. Security, I get it. Okay. So three months later, Timmy's at home one night on Outlook Web Access or Google Docs or whatever it is you guys may use. And his password's going to expire. Oh, I he says, I better change this. So he goes and changes his password. He comes into class the next day or later that week and uses that very same Mac. And he gets this when he logs in. Now, if Timmy knows what's up, he's going to click Update Keychain Password. He's going to put his old password in to unlock the keychain, assuming he remembers it. And then he'll put his new one in. It will update the keychain. And then everything will have access again to be unlocked. But they never do that. <laughs> they always, for some reason, hit continue login, even though it's not the actually deep blue highlighted option, because they just don't want to deal with this right now. That's, I don't want to deal with that. They, if they click create new keychain, all their passwords will be wiped out. Uh, we're still happy. They're semi happy. They haven't discovered all their passwords they clicked, remember, password are gone yet. But they're happy because they're logged in. So if they hit continue login, the next time they open up, whether it be Safari or CyberDuck or whatever app they're using that has got something remembered in their keychain, it's going to keep prompting them. What's your login keychain so we can unlock it and get to your passwords? What's your login keychain? And they'll probably get frustrated. And I, I've actually had people unplug the Mac because they thought that would help. Um, but they come down to the help desk and I say, you know, what's going on? This is, this is garbage. OK, great. We could go down to the lab with them, or remote using ARD, go into keychain access in the utilities, and go to delete their login keychain, delete it, and their reference files. Problem solved. If they remember their old password, we could unlock it and update it. That'd be great, but that never happens. So we go and delete it. OK, they're up and running. But what if we could automate this? So if we ran a script to do an RM RF, recursively force, to users, asterisk meaning anybody in users, library keychains, asterisk any keychain, it would remove all the keychains and just the keychains. I do need to caution, you do need to be careful with the RM command. If you want a great example, uh, go Google Pixar Toy Story RM command. <laughs> okay, people have seen it. Um, they almost deleted Toy Story 2 entirely. They were saved by somebody who worked at home because somebody ran a Unix command on the entire directory. So you just got to be careful when you do an RMRF to make sure that you're really going to the directory you want, because when you run that, it's going. So that's great. We got this command we can run, and that'll remove the keychain. Yeah, they won't have their passwords remembered, but maybe it's just a kiosk or an open area. And we don't care if their passwords are there after more than the time that they log in and use it. So if we hop into ARD or SSH, we could run that command. That's great. But, you know, it's not necessarily going to automate that. Before I move to the next little part about automating that, does anybody have any questions on the, the keychain part itself? Yeah. So in that situation, you just delete keychain. Yep. In that situation, you just delete keychain. Correct. And all the certs and everything are intact. It's the login keychain that we're, we're dumping there, because that's in their user's directory. OK. Yep. I'm going to pass the box over there. And this was their AD password, right? Correct. Their AD password was the login keychain that unlocked it. And then that is their user directory login keychain that we're talking about. Got it. Anybody else? All right. So we want to automate this. So we could use a launch daemon or launch agent. But a launch daemon or agent is, is basically a startup process, for lack of a better term. So if you go to launchd.info, it's a fantastic technical write-up about everything you need to know about them, 
how to write it by hand, how they trigger. But the most important part is this chart here. This tells us for each different type where they are and who they run as. So a user agent is going to be in their user directory, so tilde library, whoever it is, and it'll run as them when they log in. A global agent will be in the library launch agents directory, so it would run for anybody that logs in at the time of login. A global daemon would run as root or whoever we specify as a key value. If you read the technical uh, write-up, you can specify keys, and I'll be getting to that in just a little bit, of who that's running as. And system and uh, agent and daemons, I don't, I don't really touch. I try and stay away from those because who knows how long we'll be able to get to them with SIP. So don't really need it either because you can just do a global daemon or agent and, and get in there. Daemons run at the time of boot. Agents run when a user logs in. So let's, let's look at a, a launch daemon in the sense of what we want to do with the keychain here. So it's going to run as root, and then it'll be otherwise specified. And we're going to put it in slash library, slash launch daemons. And we're going to give it the name we want between the dot com and dot, or the com dot and plist. We don't really care. So we'll say Dr. Emmett Brown is our developer, and it's going to be a startup. So if we go and look at that plist, this is what it's going to look like. It's got our header up top, our version. And it's got our label of what it is. Our key value is launch only once. And it's going to be true. So we only want it to launch once. We're going to say we want it to run at load. True. So it'll run when the Mac boots up. And then our program argument will be to a script. So using example of my alma mater again, we had a directory and library where we stored various different components that we needed. So in the library, in that directory, in scripts, we have a key clean .sh. And what that script is in that directory is just that command that we were talking about before. It also makes a dummy file in that kind of as a proof of concept so that we would know when that took place. If we're only running this one, we would just make a uh, file with the date, time, minutes, and seconds of when that took place. You don't have to have that in there. That's just an extra thing just to see when it ran, when you're testing it, and just first using it. And so then it would run, it'd all be good. But there's one thing. If we do this, like I said before, all of their content in their keychain disappears. So if we think back to our login window or our policy banner, maybe we could put some information in there to say, hey, your passwords won't be saved on exit and are dumped for security. Kind of socially engineering a way to mitigate that question you might get just as a disclaimer, because you always want to let users know what's going to happen to their stuff that's local, because they like local stuff. So does anybody have any questions on daemons or agents? OK. Next problem. Where's this lessons folder for class? OK. If we use ARD. We fire it up. We'll copy to one computer. We've got our flux capacitor 101 class content here. And we got it on our desktop. So we'll go fire up ARD. We'll select a computer. We'll click the copy option. We'll say that we want to copy it to the current user's desktop folder, because our student, we'll pretend they're L admin, is logged in. It could be at the beginning of class. And we'll go ahead and just say we're just going to replace it if it already exists. We'll drag our folder in, and we'll go ahead and copy it to that computer. And it's copied. It will be on that desktop then. But that's only if they're logged in. What if we could use a launch daemon to do that? So that every time the computer reboots, it'll fill that. So we'll make another plist. We'll just call it class files now. And our script will just be a CP recursively to that folder. And then it will copy it to users all users, desktop. And we'll make a touch in another file that says class file, so we know when that got copied. Again, not necessary. OK, great. But what came first, the chicken or the egg? Because if we're copying to star users star desktop, that's only user folders that already exist. And if we're doing this as a daemon, this happens at boot. So what's going to happen with 
users that are just first logging in. So they wouldn't get it then. So here we'd make a launch agent. Only change we would make then is we'd make sure that that directory we're copying from, users have the rights to read from because obviously it's running as them. So that would go ahead, copy it as that user. And it would happen every time they log in. So if you did a copy command and it's gonna go and forcefully do that, if they already have it there, it would become refreshed. So maybe you have a kiosk or some setup where you want it to go back to default no matter what, no matter what time they log in. I know um, a lot of the labs we had technical stuff in, we wanted to reset that back because every day they were doing a different um, lesson for class. And we didn't want them to save anything on the client machine from day to day because they were starting from scratch every day. And this would help you do that because you could just have that every time they log in, boom, it copies it over. What questions do you guys have on the agent changeover? Or is that pretty straightforward? That's okay. I always try and use the box over the audio gifts. If you were doing something like deep freeze, mm -hmm. um, that, that daemon would be the way to, to have it add in every time? Yeah. You, it, either, you can look at it one of two ways. Either that daemon, if you're doing deep freeze, and that's before, or that's in your freezing, I should call it, whatever the technical term is, that would add it in every time. Or you could look at it as a discount deep freeze in a way because it's redoing that every time. Either way, it's gonna get your content there. Because again, there's many roads to grandma's house. So either the daemon itself is causing that specific directory to be frozen and then brought back, or if you're freezing it and every time it cycles back, you're back to that clean state, on the next login it'll go then. Okay, anybody have any questions on that? Why won't this app launcher, why is it verifying forever? That's usually because of Gatekeeper. So for those of you who, who are not familiar 100% with everything that Gatekeeper has to it, knowledge base article out on Apple that has it. But everybody's seen this message before, right? It's a fun message. Because, and I get it, being in education, you have software that is older than the sands of time in many cases, and you still got to run it. So, okay. Great, we go into system preferences, go to security and privacy. Let's turn that to, oh, what's this? Anywhere is gone? How am I gonna run it? Well, still gonna get that message then, because it's completely unsigned. You could disable gatekeeper. I, I can hear Rich Troughton screaming from another room. But that's not really a great idea, because then you're losing that first line of defense. And you're probably still going to get this from time to time when it needs to actually check those attributes on a slower computer. So for lack of a better word, you could make a whitelist. You could do a exception. So if we look right there on the top, that's a command I ran on this Mac here to get the attributes of that file. And we can see it's in the quarantine because it was downloaded from the internet. It's unsigned. We could modify that with this command and remove those attributes. But you want to do it on only stuff that you're 100% uh, on par, everything's clean. You want to know what's good because you are allowing it to get around that. And you're still keeping Gatekeeper on so you're protected. Hopefully that app gets redeveloped and you get a newer version at some point. So that way you're not kind of breaking the rules. And hopefully maybe the, you can get rid of that app entirely like we all want to do to Java or something like that. So does anybody have questions on gatekeeper or that attributes? Okay. How do I print? Printers are a great thing. Um, that's, that should be the icon for them. It's, <laughs> I, I, okay, people get it, okay. That's actually supposed to be the slide. So you could make a printer profile. Okay, great, it adds the print queue and you can decide or not if people can modify it a little bit and you know that's good okay it adds the print queue and again just like before kind of like our login window before we could add it through either copying it through ARD or double clicking it or taking it on a flash drive who here's use LP admin 
Okay, so LP admin is the command way to add a printer. So let's say we want to add a shared Rico multifunction, my favorite printer of all kinds. And it's going to be shared by the whole school. And this is, you know, we got a school of a thousand people, and they're going to share one printer. So we'll call it district printer. So we'll go LP admin hyphen P district printer. Where's the location? It's in the print shop. That'd be a cool place to have, I guess. Maybe. Or not. Could be a scary place. And we'll add it by its line printer name and address on the network. And this is assuming that we've already installed the driver. So maybe we installed the driver by running it through ARD or it was part of our image. We'll path to which printer model it is so it knows what it is, and the printer will be added. But and this is an HP multifunction. We'll just gloss over that. I didn't have that <coughs> model installed. It's going to say, oh, this printer's shared. Eh, we don't want that to share because the printer's ready on the network. So we go back into LP admin, hyphen P. We'll do hyphen O for option. And we'll say that the printer is shared <coughs> equals false. OK, great. The printer's not shared. The printer's added. People can print, kind of. See, this printer is kind of like a, it looks like a battleship almost. It's got a lot of trays. It's got a thing that does staples. It really resembles the uh, ice machine from Back to the Future 3 that all it does is make one cube of ice, but it looks like a Rube Goldberg machine. So we'd go, okay, let's go back into LP admin. And we'll say LP admin hyphen P to that printer. And then we could add all the options we want. We'll say, yeah, it's got the collate, it's got the tray seven, it's got everything else. Uh, prints a banner page. I don't even know what they all are. It puts a sheet of colored paper in between every print job. That way people can differentiate for sharing that printer. Okay, where did I get this information though? Because if I knew this by heart, there's something seriously wrong with me and I should seek help. Okay, LP options is LP admin's best friend. So in LP options, so you get this wall of text, I could say, all right, I'm going to deploy this printer. Let's add it to my Mac. I'll get it set up so I know it works. Let's go ahead and run LP options now on my Mac and do a hyphen L to list all the options. And you get a wall of text, and it says what you can do with it, really. It has what options you can specify. Obviously, this won't tell you what the printer has installed because the driver defines it, what came first, the chicken or the egg. So as long as you know what options you have are defined, you could then find out what's the variable and what do I want that variable to be. So we can go back, run our options command. So again, we want to work smarter, not harder. Instead of running that on every Mac, we could put it through whatever management tool we use just to add that printer, and we could go ahead, install it, printer will be there. But there's one other thing. How often do people know, let's say you add your district printer, and you've got your teachers and, and students, they can see it, they can use it. But it can do color, and it can do duplex. And by default, you have those off, because that's a really weird combination. How often do people know how to click on those drop downs to get to it? It's not exactly straightforward. So, and this is a little bit of a social engineering thing, and I, I've done this where I will have five of the same exact printer added, but they're set with different options. It may seem dumb, but you could add three or four queues, one of them that's a print queue for color on the same exact printer, one that's black and white, and one that is your duplex one, maybe black and white or not. Yeah, it's kind of wasteful, but at the same time, when an end user goes file print, all their options are there. It takes the, the guesswork out of it. Does anybody have any questions on LP admin or options? Okay. Okay, one of our last problems, because we all love updates. What is this update? Should I do it? Does IT do them? So updates are the bane of everybody's existence. And we know in system preferences, we can go and look and say, oh, yeah, it's automatically checking. Great. Who here's used the software update binary? OK. So you could run a command like this to schedule the updates to check or not check. That checkbox on the last page there, we can control it through just this simple command, whether it be through SSH, ARD, or whatever tool you're using. 
Great. OK, if we want to run commands, though, we could maybe build a daemon or any of the other things we talked about for automation, and we could run these commands. Software update L will just report back a list. If it's in a daemon, that's not exactly helpful because we're not seeing that output. But if we run it through ARD or SSH to the Mac, that's going to list all our updates. If we run a software update IA, it's going to install all available updates. If we do a IR, it will stall, install the uh, recommended ones, usually the security updates, or if they really think the new version of iTunes is cool. It's usually not. Um, so we could run any of those through any other way. OK, great. What goes with updates better than restarting? Everybody loves restarting their computer, and they love updates. So who here? has used this pain and energy saver before to schedule their reboots. OK. So you could set this setting, and it will reboot the Mac, or power it on, or sleep, or wake it at any moment in time. So that's great, but we, don't, again, don't want to do this on every single computer. So if we go and run PM set binary, we can do that. So PM set hyphen G, if you run it right now on your computer, it's going to spit back what your settings are in values. So OK, we know what those are. But this is a lab. We want to have it restart every day at 1 AM. So if we did a pseudo PM set repeat restart Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at 1 AM, great. Or we could have it wake or power on at a, separate, uh, a specific time. You know, Let's say class begins at 7. We want that Mac on at that point in time. Great. Pseudo PM set wake or power on that time. Or we could change when it goes through. For sleep, change it to 10, whatever we want. That way that value is set. And we could put that in our imaging process or wherever. Again, wherever you want to run it, you can do that. What questions do you guys have on updates and power management? I got it. There you go. I lost my place. Uh, <laughs> do the schedule update things, um, do they turn off, the, the, will those flags turn off like the little notification dialog? Like, you have updates. Would you like to use them? It won't get rid of it <laughs> if it's already there and they haven't dismissed it. But right. it will turn off the checking from the next time then because it's not going to go and on the client check. Awesome. And you could still run the software update binary to check for the available updates. And it's not going to change that schedule as far as the user sees that. Right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I don't want to throw it. I feel like I'd break someone's laptop. I don't want to be liable. So in the past, when I was looking at this, um, system updates and app updates come from two different sources from Apple. Correct. Does uh, the PM set, set both of those content streams to, to automatically check an update, or just uh, the, the system updates? So the, the PM set is just for the power settings. The, the previous one with the so I'll go back up. Yeah. OK, no, okay yeah. let's go. Um, it does all. It just stops the schedule for yes or no of that for checking. There's no checking of updates. Now, there is another flag, and I had it in the presentation, but I couldn't get it to work on High Sierra, so I took it out because that might not be viable in a couple weeks. Okay. But there is a flag in the com.apple.appstore commerce section that will be for um, auto update of the Mac OS and then the apps. Okay. And maybe it was just I was typing it wrong. I was yesterday. I was just verifying all my commands. So that might still be one on there. But if you go look for just Google App Store Commerce and then uh, Auto Update, you'll probably be, I, you'll be able to find those flags and, and you can modify okay. specifically between I want Mac OS updates to go, but not App Store. People can do their own App Store updates. Then. Okay. So if you want them both, you have to do it twice, basically. I believe so. Okay. I'm not 100% sure, but I can check on that. Okay. Anybody else before I leave the center of the room? OK. OK. So now I want to talk about, and this is kind of where we're going to be moving the box around a lot. Do you guys have any, what works for you, I guess, is the best question. What works for you for refreshing? For me, it was every semester. What works for you guys? Thanks. 
Uh, we used to do every semester um, I, when I started, and it was Deploy Studio. Mm -hmm. um, we would, I would re-image every lab every semester. Um, but once we started using um, Deep Freeze, just in the labs, just on student computers, um, I noticed that we would image them less and just add applications as faculty needed them. Um, some of the labs are pretty easy to be imaged. Some of them are very complex with a lot of preference lists set in by the faculty. So used to image them quite a bit when I did start, but once we got Deep Freeze, um, mm -hmm. it's easier just to add the software and tweak rather than re-image. The only time we re-image is when we have to buy new computers. Okay. What do you do for like faculty staff ones? That's always the question I have of, you know, it's oh. not the same exact thing. <laughs> it's not, uh, we're kind of in uh, transition right now. Um, right now we still kind of do the old method of we, we take the faculty and staff computers, set them up with a sysadmin, and then uh, set them up with a, either an AD account for uh, PCs or for Macs, I create a home user account. Cool. Um, but we're trying to make a kind of a, a deployment uh, using an MDM server and DEP, okay. moving in that direction. Saw another hand, I thought. Yeah. So when you have those set as you do, when you do a deep freeze, do you ever during the day, like does, when, when does the deep freeze go? Is that at night or? Um, I have it set up so that um, most labs uh, restart at like 3 a.m. Okay. So they're all set to go. There, is, uh, there are two labs that I can't set it to restart because uh, there are processes that are going on overnight. The computers have to be kept going. So the lab monitors in those rooms, usually students, will mm -hmm. restart those computers. Okay. So I guess then, show of hands, since that's what everybody likes, uh, what do you do when you get new hardware? Is it a case of you just pull it out of the box and then it stays as that is and you use deep freeze? Yes, no? Okay. And then, oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we have deep freeze as well and um, it seems to work really well where most of our labs um, are it's summer re-imaging. Uh, occasionally we'll do winter if we change out the hardware, but for the most part it's summer. And even then sometimes longer, like the, the Mac lab that I manage, uh, the faculty's pretty particular. And uh, if it's working, sometimes he doesn't want me to touch it. Sure. So I'm doing it this summer. That's because we're getting new hardware. Um, but with DeFreeze, it takes out a lot of the management issues of, you know, you're talking about uh, moving files around. Well, if the user account that's running has access to pull those files in to put them on the desktop, they also have access to delete them. And then the next person who logs in won't get those files. So DeFreeze allows us to have all our local users be admins. Um, and on our Macs, we actually have them set to restart upon a logout. Mm -hmm. So every single user who goes in is getting a fresh setup on the PCs. We've kind of gotten rid of that um, just because for the most part, it's when you log out, you're logging in as a new user, but if there's any kind of problem, it's always just restart. DeFreeze will kick in and, uh, and you'll get a fresh image. So if anything is weird has happened, someone's installed some crazy software. So it's really helped a lot with like lab management. Can I ask what people are doing with mobile laptops that are checked out? Are they using Deep Freeze or? Or are they just cl imaging them every time? Uh, we, we use Freeze but only on local mobile laptops that we lend out. And then uh, in our lab, we don't use Deep Freeze because um, at our school, we have kind of labs for different purposes. So um, we have music labs or art labs, and they, they like to do things uh, their own particular way. So Art students love to save their files on the IMAX, mm -hmm. and if we were to wipe them or have deep freeze on them, that would cause a catastrophe. Um, and we've tried to talk with them about not saving their files locally, but that's never gonna happen. Um, so deep freeze is not really an option in our labs, but we do um, use deep freeze on our loaner laptops, and that's just um, when the loaners come back, our student workers know that they have to restart them and um, that works good for that. Yeah, and that was kind of the same exact concept. 
for why we did the launch daemon and agents where I was in the, the graphics lab, the engineering lab. Yeah, you just you couldn't do it because it, the content gets stored locally. So if we can go selectively, that helped a little bit with that. To speak to the mobile ones, what we were doing, every time they came back in, we had a net boot set that auto imaged. All it did was just hit a button, automatically net booted then after that point, everything opened, imaging sequence went off, and they were done, put it back on a shelf, and then check it back out again. And then we were putting on a local account called Portable, and then we also had our account. It was bound to AD if they were on the campus wireless, they could log in, it would generate that mobile home for them. So the next time they would go out, they had that. So in my login window on those, we were placing saying, if you wanna take this off campus, log in one time, or if you've already taken it off campus, just go back, log in quick, give it five or 10 minutes, and then you can bug out then. That way it's as close to their desktop experience as we could get it. Anybody else do checkouts? There's only th three people that do checkouts? Try to avoid it? Why is that? Uh, we're just a very large service desk. We have like 5,000 customers, which like, I don't want to hand out stuff, so. Um. The, the, the question was, uh, wh why do you avoid checkout laptops? Gotcha. I'll use my eighth grade math teacher. There's many roads to grandma's house. It, 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 does, it does work, but is this, the thing is we don't know where things are going with the new file system. So maybe Netboot won't be a viable option in the future. Every, how many years have people been here and they say imaging is dead, long live imaging. Mm -hmm. It's been a while, it, it, it continues to happen. So maybe that will be a viable solution in the future, we just don't know with High Sierra yet. A really good um, inexpensive solution is Apple Configurator 2, uh, creating profiles and um, wiping the computer and, and downloading new profiles every time somebody new checks it out. So when you guys do that, you just do a ASR restore or internet recovery? Oh, yeah, we just, um, we just pretty much wipe the computer. Uh, we do an ASR restore okay. and then we just um, used to connect them to uh, Apple Configurator 2, uh, download the profile and uh, a new profile and, and someone was all set to go. Uh, we used it mostly for iPads, but you can apply the same knowledge to, uh, to MacBooks. Who here knows what ASR is? Just because it's an acronym I just threw out there. Okay. Apple Software Restore. So let's say you have an auto DMG disk image, whatever that may be. Could be captured some other way as well. And you want to restore it to a computer. You just would do a path of pseudo ASR. I got to remember it now. And then hyphen hyphen s for source and source to your disk image, space hyphen hyphen t for target. And then you would, could then do at the end of that a space hyphen hyphen erase, and that would then erase the drive and drop it down. And if you do auto DMG, it'll pull the recovery partition and your boot partition then. Um, trying to think if I have one on here I can do that with. But that would then get you to that, that kind of fresh state that you could run it through Configurator then, as opposed to sitting through internet recovery, which takes 30-ish minutes. Um, just a little nicety to speed that along. Okay. Anybody else have any other questions on any of that? Okay. If you have any questions, we've got a little bit of time left here. You can go ahead, uh, shoot me an email. If it's something that you got to think about and get back to me. That's my direct email. Otherwise, I'm on Slack. Feedback link is there. I'll be up here for a little bit. I'll hang around. Oh, you got a question?
Yeah, every once in a while in a computer classroom that we have, the, we don't have anybody as admin, any mm -hmm. of the AD users, they're not admin, they're just regular users. But the instructor may want to be admin. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what people are doing uh, instead of just letting them log in once so the account gets created and then going in and uh, checking the box. <laughs> you say no. Yeah, we can't all be Nancy Reagan and just say, just say no. Is it, okay, show of hands, who is making users admin at some point? Okay. How are you guys doing it? Are you, are you doing where you have them log in and you check the box, or are you having a script that does it elevate then? I'll fail. <laughs> so I have a, a, a lab that uh, uses Avid Media Composer 8.8. .8, and to use Avid Media Composer now, a Mac user has to be an admin. There's no other option. So um, all of those computers are actually on deep freeze. That's our solution. Um, they were on deep freeze before. Um, so running uh, that script, running a, a freeze to get rid of files is really um, the, only, the only good way to do it. Um, I've noticed quite a few applications, at least that the, our fine arts college is running. Uh, users have to be an admin to actually manage that, that application and to do the things that we need them to do. So Got it. Yeah. deep freeze. <laughs> So we actually <clears throat> um, make all of our students admins of our laptops because ironically we want to teach them how to use their laptops responsibly um, because when they leave our school they're going to be admins to their computers. Um, but we, we're not crazy at the same time. So we use Jamf to lock down a lot of the um, applications that we don't want them to go in. FaceTime, messages, mm -hmm. um, disk utility, terminal, keychain, yep, the, one one. the list goes, yeah, on, on one to one, uh, fourth grade to ninth grade. So, you know, we, we, we tell them we give them this great responsibility, but we, we kind of pull the reins in a little. Got it, yeah. You just that? What's that? If somebody blows up the you just save. Yeah, so in the beginning of the year, they, they read our AUA. Um, and they sign it, and we say, if you mess it up, we're going to erase it. And we've done it, and it's fun. <laughs> uh, fortunately, we're not giving too many admin privileges out, but if faculty request admin privileges on their office machine, we, we've been told we basically have to give it to them, no questions asked by, you know, that's kind of a stupid policy, in fact, yes, you ask me, but that's so we do it. So what we're doing is we're not actually giving their normal account admin privileges. We're actually setting up a secondary account uh, that they, we've told them really don't use this one unless you absolutely have to. Um, if you know, unless you're installing software or something like that, it kind of encourages them to kind of think a second time before entering that additional username and password. I know with the Mac, it's not as much of an issue where they it's, it's going to prompt them for account credentials when it, to do something important. But this way, it kind of just separates that second account out from their normal one. In case they screw that account up, we can always just go ahead and wipe that account without wiping out their stuff. Sure. And is that just a local account you're generating then? That's a local account, yeah. OK. And how, how are you guys auditing that? Like, Can you pull that back? Uh, well, we've been using uh, the, the um, previous, uh, previously we were using the, the create user package okay. uh, tool. Uh, now, at this point, I'm using, uh, I forget what the, the command line, uh, um, PSCL. Uh, the, it's uh, the um, sysadmin CTL. Oh, okay. uh, oh CTL, yeah. Yeah, to create, uh, to create the accounts uh, on an individual basis. We're not automating that much at, at this point. Okay. It's on a one to one. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so I manage uh, a, lot of, a lot of different labs, and we use Active Directory and Deep Freeze. And um, it, a lot of it was having, getting instructors to buy into having the computers refresh every login. At, you know, at login, or at uh, logout, it restarts. Deep Freeze you know, basically sets it back to a zero state, mm -hmm. or a known good state. Um, what we do for elevating admin rights, because we ran into, especially in the art department and graphic design departments, students wanted to bring in their own tablets from home, and so they needed drivers and elevated rights. Um, or they, you know, a professor would bring in photo scanners or, you know, any, any, you know, any number of little devices that they needed. So we use the directory services tool because we use AD. And then we choose the student group, the uh, faculty group, and the, the, uh, the staff group. And so what it does is it, once they log in, it'll parse, are they a member of that group? If yes, give this user admin rights when they log in. And so then they can install their drivers, do whatever they need to do. They'll still get the, uh, the pop-up mm -hmm. for um, authentication uh, to install drivers, but as long as they know that they have to use their account to do it and they don't have to get someone from IT, then they can install it. And all the professors, I worked with all of them to know that they could, do, you know, yeah, just have your student log in like they normally would, it'll install their drivers. And they've been really, really happy. Um, but I, I understand when, you know, because I always have students that want to save to the desktops. And so we created file shares that are then soft linked off of their uh, normal home directories and professors can create those, put documents and whatever they need for the classes. Students can then save things there. Um, it automatically shows up when they log in because it's a soft link off their home directory. So that helps solve that problem. You know, huge red files in video, you know, where it's, you know, 180 gigs. That's not going to, that's not going to help that. No. <laughs> so. That video files thing actually brings up one thing that I was debating putting in here. What do you guys do in a lab for large file cleanup? Like I had once a month go through and nuke home directories that were older than X number of days. Because in a lab where we had, thankfully, SSDs, but they were 128 gig in an open area, it would kind of pile up, pile up, pile up, and then drives full. Anybody doing any cleanup like that? Okay. Yeah. Um, I just pretty much go with the uh, scorched earth policy. Whenever they log off, their uh, profiles go bye bye. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah, so if someone says, yeah, I've been, because they have, uh, through Active Directory, they have their, um, <coughs> excuse me, their home directories as well as they have um, uh, access to their Google Drive. So anytime you need to save something, you have options as well as, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, your AFS account, you have places to store things. So somebody says they logged off and they said, oh, you know, I had something on there. I said, you're absolutely right. You had something on there. So <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> so like I said, you know, don't have that issue anymore of uh, space being filled up. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Okay. That 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 does work. <laughs> yeah. And you could always filter by size too. If if you wanted to, you could be a little bit granular, but I like it. So we do the same thing, except we just do it at the end of the semester and it's just yeah. a script and jamf that hits the different smart groups for each room and says, Okay, end of the semester, blow all these directories away. They're gone. Yeah. Yeah, we had a policy and just basically checked uh, the capacity of the hard drives to see if it reached maybe 75%. Mm -hmm. And then we ran some scripts to like maybe clear caches or do th something like that. But we didn't have permission to erase uh, the data from the students. But yeah. we, we noticed there were a lot of uh, places on, uh, on the computer that, that could help give them some space. Uh, so we just... Um, we're on the lookout with that policy to always run and see if the computer falls in that category, then run this. Gotcha. That's neat. Okay. 
Any other last minute questions? Yeah, Mark? So related to that, because um, I actually really like that idea of like if we have a machine that's like hidden, mm -hmm. like maybe seventy five percent capacity. Start doing some work on it, but um, maybe as a way to warn people, have like the policies kind of in that login banner. Um, all of our machines are set with like a local student account because we just have too many students to throw into the AD every semester. So, um, would does that does that show up after lo after you log in or is it before login when you have to accept those terms? Where does the, that show up? That's before login. So okay. If you were to throw that up, it comes up, and then you click accept, and then you can get to the username and password field. I got it. So our, our machines are actually set to do like an auto login as students. So got it. We so we use Geek Tool right now. It's kind of like a little overlay on the desktop, and it, we have a couple of little things like that, but nobody ever reads them. So <laughs> when it auto logs in, is it auto logged in when they get to the lab? Yeah. Okay, I was gonna say because you could have a notification center go on a launch agent that would pop up something in there. Okay. But yeah, you could get really annoying and just run a notification center like every 30 seconds. It would just oh. keep popping up. Not 30 <laughs> seconds. That might be overkill. Hmm. Yeah, I saw a hand go up when he had said that. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, so we're just doing uh, student so that student thing with the overlay on the desktop. Uh, so just some information. But we've oh God. Uh, the, the name of the, the tool is failing me now, but it's for PCs and it would just throw up and we could, because when we have support calls, you know, we'd want to know, hey, what, what information do you have? Give me your, we have our inventory tag, hard drive size, different things. Um, but now we just change the desktop background and throw up some information that says, hey, because when you do use deep freeze, your stuff's going to be gone when you log out, save to a flash drive. And um, I did just want to address, like, I don't know if the people who are using deep freeze, uh, but kind of step back from it because of, I mean, we use thaw spaces. Um, and that's a great place where you can still allow people to save things locally. It's just as wide open as if you didn't have deep freeze at all, you know, so the next student could come and sit down and delete your stuff or edit your things. But that way, your, your mo most of your user information, your applications are all protected, but then there's just an open size on the drive, 50 gigs, 100 gigs, whatever it is. It usually is the graphics areas, and it's just kind of, it's free for all, but it gives them the ability to store things on that machine. It is a bit limited, of course, because it's local just to that hard drive. So if they come to class, but usually it's not really for the open labs, it's more for our teaching labs where they're gonna sit at the same machine every day, so they have those files there as kind of a backup, um, as well as, you know, external hard drives and stuff. Got it, yeah. Okay. Yep. So I have a question on like uh, restricting access with uh, Jamf, because that was interesting to me. So um, our users request local admin access through self-service and and it's all through our ticketing system, so their manager just gets an update and they have a reason why and their manager approves it, and if mm -hmm. it gets approved, then it's all an automated process. And then they have a directory account where it's named.numbered LA for local admin, and then they're instructed to never log into a computer with that, but just to authenticate and elevate. But one problem we had was that there was a frustrated Mac user, because we use Landesk and now Avanti, and it was like causing a reboot and he didn't understand why, so he just tarballed the whole thing. But I was wondering like, if with Jamf you could we could still have someone who has full access to their computer with their local admin account, but then they could, we could restrict certain things like that. It, what restricted software does is it looks for, you can either go by wildcard of name or a specific app name, mm -hmm. and then the daemon uh, for that looks for that process will kill it and then send a email notification or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can throw a splash page up. That's actually how I restricted uh, when new OSs would come out. Although one guy beat me, he literally had it by like, I'd say 30 seconds before me, and he had it installed. <laughs> he was already off to the races, so, yeah. Okay. But yeah, it, so it just, it just uses that daemon uh, through the, uh, the binary to go kill that. Okay. Okay. We got six minutes left, and I know I'm between you and lunch. So, thank you. Feedback link is there. Uh, if you got any questions, go ahead, shoot me an email, or find me on Slack. Email is usually... Uh, best and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.